Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I wanted to tell you that I've been sober this time since July 15th, 1997, that I have a home group. It's Buda Big Book Group in Buda, Texas, or Buddha, whichever you prefer. And um, and I'm just so glad to be here. Thank you. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what I was like. Um, and I'm the kind of guy that is always thinking about me, 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 me. Uh, I've heard somebody describe it as my eyes are too close. Um, what about I? Um, so I grew up in this family that that tried to instill some values in me and some principles about relationships uh, that I got from watching what they did and what I got wasn't very good. Um, but I got, I had some really good parents that did uh, teach me about working hard, having some work ethics and um, to show up, suit up, to do what I needed to do. My name is James Cecil Ruby the Third. I hated that. I hated growing up with that. I didn't know what to do with it. My my all all the men in my family built highways, and um, my grandparents. Neither one of my grandfathers ever finished school, but were self made, self taught. Um, I'd watch my father's father, and the way that he did things was he ran things. He ran everything. And my dad tried to do the same thing, and I did too. Um, I had a problem with alcohol fairly early on, and uh, I love going to treatment. Plastic fitted mattresses and sweaty little pillows. Great opportunity to meet my next ex wife, right? I could talk about relationships in unrecovery, but uh, I'm here for the recovery portion. So I will tell you that my family started sending me to AA in 1978. And um, I didn't get this thing till 97. And I was absolutely at the point of not thinking I could. Um, I saw AA work for other people, but I didn't think it would work for me. I had done oodles of therapy and group therapy. I loved going to therapy. And I went to group therapy till they threw me out. You know, I've been there like 10 years. And uh, that's where my lovely bride and I met. And, uh, oh, my God, uh, I was smitten with Marty the first time I saw her, you know. And the only way I knew to show that was to pick on her. Um, and and one of the first things I said to her was, who, who, put, who made you second in command of the group? You know, it's like, I don't know how to say, hey, you're really attractive, and I want to get to know you more. And um, I'm just so grateful that Marty was in my life because when I got sober this time, she picked me up from the airport and she took me to my first meeting. And uh, I don't know that I'd be here if she wasn't there because I'd done that so many, many times before. I didn't understand um, the importance of uh, why, of what I needed to be doing. I didn't understand what I needed to do differently than what I was doing before. But one of the things that I started doing was, was I, I got together with another guy. This time when I went to, to treatment in 97, it was just guys. There wasn't any women there and, uh, in my group. And, uh, um, it was another guy that sat down and explained what the black part of this big book meant, you know, and I needed that so much. And that was my first relationship in recovery and continued to be, um, I, I have a sponsor today and, uh, I hope that I always do. I'll be in trouble if I don't come point it out to me, would you? Um, oh, I will. yes, she will. <laughs> but 
what I knew about relationships I'd gotten from my parents. And the only thing I'd watched was how my dad was in George, you know, and, uh, and I knew that I loved Marty dearly, uh, that, that there was nobody I'd ever felt as strongly about in my life. And I thought that that's all I needed. I thought that that's what a relationship took. And it wasn't. Um, I will tell you that I, I was a little slow on uh, continuing to do the step work. My favorite word was no. My wife would say, hey, let's go to this conference. And I'd say no. My sponsor would say, it's time for you to be sponsoring people. And I'd say no. And um, I didn't know how to say yes. So um, I was not a lot of fun to be with. And one of our greatest memories, it's not a tremendous, it's not a, a, a wonderful memory, but one of our greatest memories is a tree that Marty wanted planted. And I was so unhappy about having to plant this tree on my day off, okay? And uh, every once in a while, we'll talk about the tree. But you know what happened this year was the tree got cut down. Somebody else bought the tree and decided they didn't want it. But it, we still brought it up today. I still said, hey, you remember that tree? And she's like, oh, yeah, I remember the tree. So that's, um, that's how things go. So I'm going to, at this point, turn it over to Marty. Well, thanks, Cecil. Marty, we'll be alcoholic. Hey, Bronx, how y'all, how y'all doing, as we like to say? Um, my name is Marty Ruby and I am an alcoholic. I have not had to take a drink since October the 19th of 1989. And I'm as grateful as I know how to be about that right there. And of course, thanks to Kevin, my good friend, Kevin, that I've gotten to meet over, over these tiles. And, uh, and of course, dear Stacy for inviting us out here, uh, this fine, fine evening. We're so excited. We have power, we have lights. We have internet that it hasn't even said unstable connection one time. So yeah, we're feeling yeah. pretty sassy. Uh, I have a home group that's called the Buta Big Book Group here in Buta, Texas. And uh, I sponsor people who sponsor people and all that, all that fun stuff that y'all are so familiar with. And I love that we're in the Bronx Big Book Group. Huh. Could there be a connection? Of course there is. Um, so I like to think about um, relationships. I was you know, pondering this today. And as I tend to ponder my relationship every day, cause you know, it's about me. And, and I was thinking about how to recover from a seemingly hopeless state of friendships, love, family, and marriage. Because uh, certainly when I got here and for a long time after I got here, my relationships would just grind down into this yuck and I didn't want them anymore, you know? And, uh, and, and, <laughs> I don't know how to not do that. And I, I can tell you, um, you know, uh, I, I'd fall in love. And then um, what would happen is oftentimes I would try to get someone to be me. I wanted them to think like me, have the same values as I had. I had the same um, interests that I did. And, and then when, and I'd bully them into submission, basically. And then when they did, do all these things as I dominated them, I found them terribly uninteresting. Imagine that. Uh, they got, they, they seemed very dull. I became uninterested and I uh, would generally find someone else. And I had this pattern, you know, and, and I'd love to say, oh no, no, I'm a very virtuous woman. I, you know, I'm, I always do the right thing in relationships. Ha, no, um, that's not my experience. That's not my experience drunk. It's, it's, it's not my big experience before I got drunk. It's not my experience when I got drunk, and it's not my uh, experience once I got sober. It is my experience today, and I can tell you that the reason that it is is because you know I've had to work really hard at it. And um, oh, look, honey, I forgot to set my timer. <laughs> Whoops! <laughs> Imagine that. Um, so, uh, uh, anyway, so this is what it would happen to me over and over and over. And uh, and I like Cecil, you know, I, I came from good people, good morals, you know, all the kind of stuff, found alcohol, drank the hell out of it, 
found all of alcohol's little friends, did all of that to, um, and, and yet, uh, you know, just, just had all this trouble. And so I, when, when I met Cecil too, I was positively smitten too. And I mean, he was super cute. He was really, um, he seemed like a very larger than life character, someone who was very interesting to me. And as he said, it was very funny. Um, the way we interacted with each other in group therapy, because that's where you meet. Um, he was, uh, he was not sober. And I think I was about mm, six or seven years sober. And so what we did, instead of being, I had no ability to be honest in a relationship. And so what we did, we were about 12. And so we'd slug each other and we'd, uh, we'd talk smack about other people because that's what you do when you're spiritually fit. And, uh, and he scared me. You know, I found him, I found him very interesting. And I also found him somewhat dangerous. So, um, uh, but man, I had a terrible crush and I also had a husband at the time. So, um, anyway, that's when I met him. We didn't get together until later on, I guess about four years later. And, uh, guess what? Still had a husband, but that's a different story. Anyhow, uh, what I believe today is, um, and, and I, I'm going to fast forward to the relationship part. And I, and I don't want to just focus on a uh, intimate marriage relationship because there are relationships everywhere. I have relationships with people I work with. I have relationships with people, you know, with my family members. I have relationships with my children. I have, you know, all across the board, every person you, I have a relationship with the, with the gal that checks out, checks me out of the grocery store. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I have relationships with people I don't particularly care for. It was my husband who pointed out to me, you know, even when you hate somebody, that's still a relationship. What? Um, and it's true. But uh, what I believe today is I'm either practicing spiritual principles or I'm not. You know, I'm either working an AA program or I'm not. And I'm either moving toward a drink or I'm moving away from it. You know what? There is no middle of the road solution. No middle of the road solution in my AA program or in my married life or in my home group. I mean, I have to show up every single day. And that was one of those things. I kept looking for the easier, softer way, which meant I was going to find some loophole where this is this was my fantasy. I'd find some loophole where really all I had to do was sit on my couch all day. Guess what 2020 brought? Uh, and come to find out that was not the solution. I was not, in fact, what I was looking for. Um, so, you know, so no middle of the road solution with alcohol or with marriage or anything. Now, there's a lot of time people love to talk. Well, I don't know. You know, sometimes I ask my husband, I say, well, did you talk to your sponsor today just as a chat chat? And he says, well, yes, I did. And I go, well, what'd you talk about? He goes, we talked about work. We talked about sponsees. I'm like, what in the hell? Right. What in the living hell are you doing? Because the people I've worked, talked to and my sponsor and I, we talk about, we talk about relationships. We talk about our marriage. And I'm sure you fellas are doing the same thing. It just always brings such a chuckle to me. It's like, we talk about work. I, I don't think people even know what I do for a living, um, which is fine. I hardly know what I do for a living. Um, so, but we spend a lot of time about uh, being the right person. You know, how to be the right person. We spend, I spent a lot of time in early recovery trying to find the right person, trying to create the right person, trying to bully him into submission to be the right person. And then it was introduced to me that I could be the right person, right? Uh, and, and in other words, I'm not fixing a broken person to be the right person. If that's what I'm doing, I'm in trouble before I even get started. So, um, you know, and Cecil will probably touch on this too, but we talk also a lot about character. Who am I when no one's looking? Who am I for me, right? Do I do the right thing when no one's looking? And, and that's, a, that's a big one for me because I'm like, well, do I really need to put the grocery cart all the way back or can I just put it up on the curb? You know, and it's like, you know, do, and, and that's a very simplistic thing, but I think it's a good example for me. Um, so, to develop all these things, you know, uh, uh, I needed specific directions. 
I needed uh, absolute suggestions and I needed a design for how to do all that. Because it's all well and good to say, well, be the right person. Well, I'm going to need a clue on how to do that because I've spent my whole life living a certain way and believing that the way I was living was right. Here's the trouble with believing I'm right is in order to believe that I'm right, you must be wrong. So now we have this very black and white thing here too. If I'm right, you're wrong. If I'm good, you're bad, right? All of this kind of stuff. That's very, very hard to be in a relationship with someone when I'm doing that or they're doing that. So really what I want to do, I, someone said today, I thought it was so precious. She said, you know, really what I want to do for you tonight is just play the highlight reel, right? And tell you what a great person I am and how I'm killing it and how me and Cecil have been together ooh, a long time, mm -hmm. uh, 23 something years. And that, you know, we never, we never squabble. We never, we never squander hours that might've been worthwhile. And, ooh, you know, basically I'm killing it. And that is not my experience. It's not. And and the beautiful thing is, 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 is I make a lot of mistakes in my relationship, a lot of them. And, and I have a sponsor and I get to talk to her about that. And the beauty, and I tell her what my mistakes are and she shares with me what hers are. And I love that we have this, this, this relationship. When I learn how to be honest with my sponsor, which didn't come naturally for me either. When I learn to be honest with my sponsor, I can then become honest with you and eventually become honest with the most important person in my life. That took me some time. With that, I'm going to turn it over, back over to him. Go, Boo. You going to do that for me? Yes, I'm going to do it. She's so good, I tell you. I don't know what I'd do with that. Or... So, um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, what happened and what I'm like now. Um, you know, you got to have a good relationship with God, I think. A solid relationship with God. Mm -hmm in order to have a good relationship with another human being. And, and I had this old piece of God that I'd been hanging on to for so long in sobriety. My dad died in 05. We'd, we'd gotten married in February of 05 and he died in May. And it just completely knocked my feet out from underneath me. And, uh, I had not been sponsoring anybody. I'd been refusing to sponsor anybody till I got 10 years I don't want to mess anybody's life up. See, it's all about me being good to other people, you know? And uh, I don't think about the service that I need to be providing for other people. And somebody grabbed me and they took me to a beginner's meeting. And eventually I got a sponsor, a sponsee over there. And uh, I've been hanging on to this old idea about God, that God hated me so much that if I was in a plane crash i'd survive because he wanted me to have a long miserable life and i couldn't i couldn't quite grasp all of step three i'd, I'd been hanging on to that going how can you how can you have that piece of step three that says as we understood him you know on the end the the part that's in squiggly the italics the part that's so important and i didn't understand the true meaning of step three. But when I got to sponsee, one of the first questions he asked was, why are the steps written in the past tense? And I'm like, I don't know. That's a great question. Let me get back to you. And I don't know why I did that. Normally, I would have been the kind of guy that said such and such, you know, because I wanted to have the right answer, whether it was right or not. And uh when I got with my sponsor, I fully understood. I understood what step three was about, what that piece of step three was about, what they had been doing when the book was written. And, and once again, it wasn't about me. It didn't center around me, you know? And I got a little further down the road on these steps and this step work. Now, I'll tell you one thing I had been avoiding like the plague was their traditions. At, at our old home group at Northland in Austin, they would have a traditions meeting uh, or a step meeting once a week. And if it was on the steps, fine, I'd sit in there. If it was on the traditions, I'd leave. I'd go out to the patio and smoke, you know. And uh, I didn't understand 
why the traditions were so vital, not just to AA, but to my relationships with everybody, you know? And once I started looking at the questions that they have in the grapevine on the traditions, I started to get a better idea about why these are so vital. You know, I was sitting in a tradition one meeting one time, and I was wanting to be mad at a guy because of what he had on his T-shirt, and I was going to wear the opposite T-shirt the next week. And the tradition was tradition one, right? And I looked at my questions, and my question is, uh, am I an amending member of this group, or am I divisive, right? Now, I carry that into my home. How am I going to be mending in my home, you know? I want to, I want to, I want to square things up. Things need to be equal, you know, and, and, and that's the kind of relationship that I grew up with my sisters. It's like, they got to do as much as I got to do. She's got to do as much as I got to do, you know, or it just ain't fair. It ain't right. And, um, it took me a while of doing this step work and doing these traditions to get to the point that that um, my attitude changed. See, I get to do things today. We have horses because I got horses because I thought my wife wanted the horses. I got peacocks because I thought my wife wanted the peacocks. We got dogs because I thought my wife wanted the dogs. We got cats because I thought my wife wanted the cats, right? I normally feed all these animals in the morning. And at first, I was getting a little grumpy about those horses. I was like, oh, my God, am I going to have to do this the rest of my life? Feed the horses? Clean up the poop? Three horses, that's a lot of poop, you know? And uh, I didn't even want to be on the ranch. I wanted to stay in Austin. And we moved out here at my wife's insistence. And lo and behold, I never went back. (laughs) She has great ideas if I just stop and listen to her, you know. But the thing is, I got to this place to where I I realized that I get to clean up the horse poop. I get to feed the horses. I get to do these things, you know. And so it was It was like changing my language, which changed my viewpoint. Now, I can go with that language uh, in other directions because we have children from previous spouses. Um, I have three children from Marty's first marriage, and she has one from my second. Now, I, I would have always introduced them in the past as my stepchildren. And I didn't realize the harm and damage, the separation, the pushing away that I was doing when I did that, you know. And it wasn't until I was uh, given some direction from my sponsor that I started applying a different language to the family because they are family and they are my kids. And so that changes my behavior. I don't always want to be that. Um, I don't always want to be that nice and kind guy. There are times, let me tell you. Um, do my do my needs for comfort or safety limit Marty's options? Yeah, you betcha. I think it's good for me. If if I think it's good for me, then my ego and arrogance says it's good for us, right? Back in '05, it, it was a couple of years later, a year and a half later, I decided that I was going to sell the business that Marty and I created. I didn't go in and say, hey, honey, what do you think about this idea? I went to work. I was so ate up with uh, self-pity that I told the guys to load it up. I'd called an auction house in Fort Worth, and they were going to have an auction in 10 days. (laughs) And I went home and told my bride that I've done this. And she's like, I can't believe, what What do you mean? What do you mean you're selling the business? What are you going to do? I said, I'm going to go to work and be a social worker. I'm going to go to school. 
to be a social worker. Yeah. 50 year old man going to go back to college. Yeah. You know what? She backed me. She supported me a hundred percent. No, no if, ands or nothing. There might've been a little feed dragging at first, but she got on board and stayed on board. You know, I mean, Oh my God, I, I just cannot tell you the support and love that my wife showed me despite my lack of partnership in making that decision, you know? Um, and, and, and another thing I have to stop and ask myself is how, it, how do I contribute spiritually to the relationship, you know? Um, Prior to COVID, I always left. I always left what meeting we were going to go to up to Mark. You know, there were some that I would go to on my own, but I almost always wanted to leave them up to her. I never, I never did join in. Well, I think I'll go to this one instead. I do have some that I do attend or did attend, but uh, and now I do on Zoom as well. I have guys I sponsor. You know. I have a sponsor I spend time with weekly uh, by phone, but um, I've got all these people, all these relationships that have, that have grown because of my connection to God, right? And the relationship that I formed with that first sponsor and how much our relationship has grown in itself. men's groups. I know Charlie P's on here and he's probably going to wonder when I'm going to man to man. And I know it's coming because I got a bunch of guys I sponsor that are going to be going, what about the man to man group? You know, but I used to avoid men's. I, I avoided all uh, conferences, e any of that stuff. It was like, no, not till I got 10 years. Well, you can tell I got over 10 years, but I still, on occasion, we'll throw up no as my favorite word. And uh, <laughs> my wife with her group has this deal about hashtag just say yes. Okay. And some of my guys have picked up on this hashtag just say yes, because their wives are in that group. And so um, I just say yes. Okay. And I know, Charlie, I'm coming to man to man. Coming up. Um <clears throat> I love going to conferences and I love going to the world world uh, international conference. I was so afraid to go to that thing then and uh, just absolutely um, had such a spiritual experience from that. You know, you get these, these lanyards that you wear with your name on it and what your home group is and there's 50, 60,000 of you there, right? And I didn't want to wear that thing. I was like, I do not want to do that. And and I told Marty, I said, honey, let's don't get the lanyards, you know. And she's like, well, I don't know what you're going to do, but I'm getting mine first thing in the morning. So the good partner that she is, right? So I go get my lanyard. And I'm standing there Sunday coming out of the last, last meeting. And I'm standing on downtown in downtown San Antonio, and there's 60,000 other people there. And the only people that look out of place are those that don't have lanyard. Oh my God. I am a part of this thing. I've been trying to hold myself out separate from this relationship and all others in any form or fashion that I can. Okay. And that's not what this is about. What this is about is joining. You know, what this is about is going to the conferences, going to the meetings, being a part of, uh, doing some work, you know. There's a guy, there's, there's a guy that I read a book, some about some kind of glasses, right? I know y'all know what I'm talking about. But he talks about how everybody's his sponsor, you know. And then when everything else fails, what he does is goes and helps somebody else and everything else works itself out. That business stuff worked itself out. I didn't need to worry about that. Um, 
I have a beautiful life today with four beautiful kids and beautiful wife and uh, three horses, three dogs, three cats, and three peacocks. Oh, my God. I'm the luckiest guy in the world. And uh, I, I want to thank my wife for much of that and God for the rest. That's all I got. Your turn again. Thanks. Ain't he sweet? Um, so much good stuff. You know, and here's where it gets really good too, is that we got uh, we got the four kids and um, three of them are married, one's fixing to be, but two of the kids from my first marriage uh, had Cecil perform the ceremony. Now, let me tell you, when he showed up on the scene, they weren't exactly that keen on him. You know how it goes, blending families and all. But, uh, you know, as we continue to practice and demonstrate, practice these principles and demonstrate uh, the power of God and his way of life, remarkable things happen. Remarkable things happen. Um, so one of the things that I want to talk about is, for me, one of the greatest gifts of my sobriety is learning how to stay at the table, Right. And to stay at the table, no matter how hard the conversation is, no matter how scary it can be, but knowing that I have my reliance on God and that I can stay at the table. I got a couple of examples of what I used to be, basically, was a table flipper, right? We'd, ha we'd, we'd have a conversation. I'd get pissed off because that's, that's my default setting. And I'd take that table, flip it, cuss you out slam the door on my way out, get to my car, burst into tears, and wonder why I was alone one more time. Over and over and over. You know, how did, how did this happen? Well, you know, it, it's pretty obvious in hindsight because I didn't know how to stay at the table. Uh, one of my sons, um, he's adorable, and he's also a pain. <clears throat> I'm just going to be real blunt about it. He's a pain. And the truth of the matter is he's been mad at his mama for about 15 years. You know, he mad. He mad. He can't decide whether he loves his mama or he's mad at his mama. And so a couple of months ago, we had an entire list of grievances he wanted to share with me. I thought, oh, well, won't this be fun? I can hardly wait. Let me rush right over, sugar. So, um... Uh, but I did, because that's what I've been taught to do. And that's, this is the work my sponsor and I've been doing for the last year. And, um, and so I sat at the table, and, and, and he told me everything I had done wrong since, you know, 1990. And, he, you know, yeah, there's some stuff I've done wrong. Could I have been a better mom? Sure I could, you know? And I listened, and I listened. And I listened and I had to, I had to pray to God to restrain of, pen, of tongue. And I really wanted to reach across the table and just boink him right in the forehead. And, uh, and I didn't. And I listened. And I asked God to help me listen. You know, and, 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 and I was praying the whole way through, right? This kid's in a lot of pain. This kid's in a lot. He doesn't even know. He doesn't even know how much pain he's in. He's getting mad, which I can respect, right? I show up in precisely the same way, just mad. Whatever it is, I'm just mad. And so uh, when he got done, I, you know, I listened and I said, well, is there anything else? Because that's what you've taught me to do. Is there anything else? I mean, you got a captive audience. You know, I stayed away from sarcasm. I stayed away from defending myself. I did all the things that you've taught me to do. And he goes, well, no, there's not. And the words that came out of my mouth were 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 pretty profound because it's one of those things you know how when God shows up and you, you and stuff's coming out of your mouth and it surprises the hell out of you but you go hmm I sound very good. Um, what I was able to say because I've learned how to stay at the table even when it's hard and I want to be mad. As I said, son, I love you, and if this afternoon. You want to throw me out of your house and tell me to never come back. I'll do that because I respect you. And I can tell you this, that no matter what, 
I will love you as much as I love you right this minute. That will never change. That will never change. And see what that's about. You know, of course, now he ain't got nothing to say to that because I'm not fighting, right? I am not fighting. So uh, I'd love to say we kissed, we made up, we've had this beautiful relationship ever since. No, we haven't. We haven't. But I can tell you, he knows his mama loves him. And his war is within himself. It's not with me, right? And so that was a profound experience for me. Profound experience for me. Didn't know I had it in me. And the truth of the matter is, I don't have it in me. But with God's help, I absolutely do. I can practice these principles you've taught me. I can show up. And I can tell you, the work I've done around this troubled relationship has 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 had repercussions in every other relationship in my life. Every single one. Being able to sit at the table in a difficult relationship with love and kindness and compassion and honesty. Not just honesty with him. Most importantly is honesty with myself. You see, I love that kid. He's a pain in my ass and I love him. I love him with every cell in my body. And you know what? He's exactly like me. That's what makes it so darn hard, you know? Um, but I love him. And, and there's nothing he can say or do that's going to change that. And that's the honest truth for me. That's the honest truth for me. And can I act from a place of principle and love and from my heart, right? Which is the truth. Or must I react from my head and say, you ain't going to talk to me like that. You ain't got no right to talk to me like that. You're disrespecting me and all that kind of stuff, which is where I am when I'm in columns one and two. And believe me, I've spent my share of time in columns one and two with this kid. Because I keep doing the work and I keep doing the work and I keep doing the work. I'm much better to able to live in columns three and four. And that's where the solution is for me. That's how I connect with my creator. And if I can connect with my creator, I can, I can see the truth, right? And I love that we start the, this meeting with that prayer. Please help me see the truth. I pray that all the time. Notice I don't say, please help me see my truth. And you didn't say that either. You said, please help me see the truth. The truth as God would have it, not as I would have it. Um, so I got off on that little rant. Thank you for listening. Um, but that's what I that's what I know about staying at the table today. Is it easy? No. Did I want to throw up at times? Yes. Right? And this is and, and let me tell you, all of this stuff. And and we had we had a wedding for my daughter and and uh uh and my son didn't come. My son didn't come because you know COVID and long story, I won't bore you with that. Um but he didn't come. He and his wife and his children did not come. But we came. Everyone else came. And and as a result of all of that, for Christmas, my kid, you know what? I've been divorced since 1997 from my children's father. And uh and this Christmas, for the first time since 1997, I, I turned to Cecil at one point. I had that intuitive thought before Christmas, and I said, hey. What do you think about inviting the kid's dad and his wife over for Christmas Eve? Cecil, who I completely expected to go, no, <laughs> did not. He said, well, I think that'd be a good idea. And we did that. We invited them. They graciously accepted. We had the most incredible Christmas Eve dinner of our lives, right? And my children, our children, got to share with us the next day that it was also the greatest Christmas Eve of their life. Now, see, I, I didn't make that up. I didn't, I didn't say, you know what I'm going to come up with? I didn't do any of that. I just tried to listen to the truth, act from my heart, not react from my head, you know, because the reaction from my head is, I ain't having my ex-husband up in my house. You know what he did to me in 1997? You know, really? Still? Come on now. Come on. I'm either practicing spiritual principles or I'm not. 
what spiritual principle do I want to practice today? Is it inclusion? Is it unity? Is it respect? Is it dignity? These kinds of things that we that we love to give a lot of lip service to until until I'm faced with the prospect of my ex-husband at the table. Right? So um yeah. Needless to say, uh, I, I like to think about in terms of we talk, there's that great line in the in the book that talks about yes, there is a long road of reconstruction ahead. We must take the lead. I think those are two of the most powerful sentences in there. And it and it and 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 here's the thing for me. I always like to think about that reconstruction. Thing is, I didn't have any construction. So there was nothing to reconstruct. I had to actually work on constructing uh, relationships that had depth and meaning and dignity and respect and uh, and mutual admiration for one another, if you will. Um, so <laughs> uh, now back to me and Cecil, I want to tell you, uh, what I want to tell you is that, oh, we love each other and we work everything out and, and oh my God, we never have a crossword. <clears throat> oh my God. I had I had evening review, I think it was last week, like three or four days in a row. Impatient, impatient, ripped his head off, impatient. Well, could I have done better? Not been such a hag, you know, these kinds of things. Um, but but I'll tell you this, we used to fight like cats and dogs. I mean cats and dogs. Where I come from, uh the my role models were in a marriage, re- marriage relationship in a family was that the loudest and maddest one wins. And I got to tell you, I think it came from the same yeah. gene pool, right? Because that's how we showed up. That's how we interacted with each other, you know? And, 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 and talking about Cecil's dad, who, who uh, up to one of my favorite human beings in the whole world. And, uh, uh, and, and I have to say I was one of his. He said to me one time early on in our relationship, uh, he said, kid, I don't know if y'all are going to make it. I'm like, what? What? Whatever gave you that idea? After I'm screaming my way through another afternoon with my husband in front of my father-in-law. I didn't care. I didn't care who heard it. Right. I had, I had things to say and they and he needed to hear them, you know, and uh, and at the same time, the effect of that was. Uh, like cold water over my head. Thank God. You know, I had, I had had role models for relationships that either loudest and maddest wins, or uh, I grew up, you know, I was born in 1961. So I watched television a lot. And so my role models were Samantha and Darren on Bewitched. She never told the truth to him in her life, right? Mm -hmm. Or the Brady Bunch. They just solved every little problem in about 22 minutes right? What's the big deal? Um, and they looked really cute doing it. So, um, but, but needless to say, um, not very practical uh, for me. And, the, and, the, and what I showed up into this relationship with, like you said, oh, I loved him. I was crazy about him. I knew he was the one for me. And, uh, and I thought that was going to be enough. You know, that, that old thing, you, you'll see old people like my age will go, well, you can't live on love alone, you know? And I'm like, I don't know what they're talking about. But 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 I showed up very dishonest. One of the things is uh, I would go shopping with my own damn money, mind you, and I wouldn't bring in all the packages. If I bought five pairs of shoes, I only let him see two. Like he's And he's never said anything to me about any of this. But this is the level of dishonesty I'm showing up with. If he says, how much do you weigh? I'd say 206. And I'd really be 230, you know what I mean? But it, just that inability to tell the truth. And, you know, if they say in the book, uh, if once in a while, he may tell the truth, which means most of the time I'm lying. I couldn't sit at the table and talk about money without crying, becoming a victim, and shutting that stuff down. I acted like I was about seven years old around finances. And he would just go, uh, uh, can we not, can we have a conversation? I'm like, no. And so what I did was I, I, I held him hostage. I was a liar. Uh, uh, 
oh, I would, I would complain as a victim that my emotional needs weren't being met, whatever that means. Uh, and, and, and I would never give one more ounce than what I was being given. And you better give it first because I'm not taking that risk, right? This is how I'm showing up. Everything was a quid pro quo. I'll cook the food, but you better wash the dishes. I'll go get the groceries, but you better put them up, right? There was no, there was no fun and for free. None of it, right? Everything was a quid, quid, quo, quid pro quo, you know? And then what happened is I would incessantly place demands and expectations on him that he could never possibly meet. And it's not just him. That's with my with him. That's with bosses. That's with children and siblings and, and anyone who... <laughs> Who, who dared cross my path? Uh, but here's the thing. I would put those expectations and demands on you. And then when you didn't meet them, it was a total setup. When you didn't meet them, I would be hurt, angry, be convinced I was the victim, how you had done me wrong. And now you were no damn good. Couldn't trust you. You're not trustworthy. You're not reliable. You know what I mean? You don't listen. You see that giant setup that I would just do over and over in this relationship, you know? And, 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 and so I go to my sponsor or my trusted friends and I say, this is terrible. It's just awful. We fight all the time. And, uh, and, and, and well, you know, you know, honey, the answer is God. You've got to rely on God. I'm like, what are you talking about? Don't you see? I have actual problems here. And 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 I, I could not be convinced that God was the answer. I couldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Right. And so, um, you know, I what? So you 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 tell me this thing I can't see, touch, smell anything that's going to solve my problems. Whatever you can. And this is well into sobriety. You can see the level of self reliance I'm running on. Run an extreme example of self will run right though. I don't think so at all. I think I'm killing it. And really what I was doing is killing my relationship with Cecil, the person I love more than anything. Okay. And the answer was God. The answer was God. And I remember just being in so much agony, so much pain. And it came to me, you know, I used to pray all the time, just like a mantra, 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 mantra. And I got this prayer that came to me, given to me somehow it showed up and it said, God, please give Cecil a new wife and let it be me. Right. Because I began to finally understand that I was the problem, that that spiritual axiom, if there is a disturbance, it lies in me. That I was selfish and self-centered. Oh, don't get me wrong. I can spot his a mile away. You bet. You, you know, I can. Right. But that doesn't matter. It tells me I'm to disregard the other man entirely. The inventory is mine and not the other man's. It just says this over and over. If there, if the problem is me, there's a solution. If there's a, if the problem is him, we're dead in the water. We're done. Oh, <laughs> you know, um, I don't know what I'm going to follow that up with, but I was thinking about, you know, we hear things in AA meetings, and they're and they're not always AA. You know. I, I, I catch pieces that other people talk about, and I think I'm going to hold on to that. One. Um, that's a good idea, right? And and one of these came from a really good a good guy that I looked up to, and he talked about the pause. And he said that he didn't start to get the pause till he had 13 years. And I was like, well, no use of me trying. I don't have 13 years yet, you know? So I just kicked back, and I'm waiting for the pause. And I got about 16 years, 17 years, and I'm going, when's this pause going to start, Charles, you know? And uh, it wasn't until a couple, of, a couple of three years after that that I started noticing in the book that the pause is on page 87. And they got a bunch of questions on page 86 that if I do those on a regular basis, and maybe, maybe I might get that pause, you know? And one of those questions that I really, I really, I look forward to it every day was a kind and loving towards all, right? And that's supposed to be a yes or a no. I don't know that I've ever said yes. 
I can usually find something, somebody somewhere that I was not absolutely kind and loving towards. Um, but you know, if I'm going to be kind and loving at my meeting, why wouldn't I want to be kind and loving in my house? And I think that if, if I'm not kind and loving, if it's not kind and loving, it's not AI, you know? And that's what, that's what we get is kind and loving. And the closer I get towards answering a yes about kind and loving towards all, the closer I get to being in that relationship with God, you know? The more likely I'm going to be connected with him all day long or her. And the more likely I'm going to be kind and loving at home, no matter what. Marty talked about the screaming and hollering. And the thing that I used to love to do was put up the hand, you know, talk to the hand. <laughs> she, she, she moved me, right? We're forever trying, we're forever what, arranging the lights. She moved me until she had me right across the street. <laughs> yes, I did. Yeah. And so I'd say, this is abusive. I'm going home, you know, <laughs> and I would go to the house. It's like, I'm not going to talk to you. And uh, that is not kind and loving. That is far from it. It's the opposite, you know. Um, I, had a, I, had a guy, I had a guy that needed some form of transportation, and I lent him my wife's bicycle. Didn't think a thing about saying, hey, honey, I have this idea about lending a bicycle, the little cracky mix smokes a lot. And um, he didn't make it, neither did the bike. But, I buy a bicycle. you know, that kind of loving that I would generously give to somebody I don't even know. Mm -hmm. Why can't I do that at home? Like she's talking about. No quid pro quo. You know, I look forward every day to going and cleaning horse stalls and feeding the animals and it's my turn to be with God it's my time spent with him where I find out what my corrective measures are for the day you know that's my meditation time and um, I'm so fortunate that I have the life I have and a lot of that life is because of her. Because I listen to her. I don't know what else to tell you, but I'm glad I'm glad to be here tonight and I hope that I said something of benefit to somebody. Um, just real quick, just a couple of other things I want to say. Um, and one of the things that was pivotal in, in our relationship for me was that one day I had done some, I don't even remember what it is I had done exactly, but man, he was really, really upset with me. And I said, oh, honey, please believe me when I tell you, I never meant to uh, hurt your feelings or upset you. I, I just really didn't think of you at all. You just didn't hit my radar. And he, and, he, and he said, you see, that's the worst part at all of all. You didn't even think about me. I was like, oh. Oh, and I thought about how painful it would be for me if he had not thought of me. And I, and I asked God, please, please remove that level of inconsideration uh, and disrespect. Um, I, I don't ever want to not think of him again. And, 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 and you know, um, and, and, and I always say, I always say, I don't want to take care of him. I want to take care with him, right? I want to take care with him. And so um, you, the 12 steps and the 12 traditions, I didn't get to talk nearly enough about that, but, and, 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 and my beloved uh, fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. This is where I learned the directions on how to be in a relationship, right? This is where I was transformed. This is where I was offered suggestions. And yes, 
I even took them and did what was suggested. And, and, and this is where you gave me so freely this design for living that works in not just rough going, but in every single situation of my life, every single one. And so I never have to be alone again, never. And I never have to flip another table. I never have to flip another table and I never have to cuss anyone out, not ever again. Who thought that was possible? And most importantly, I can learn how to enjoy my peace of mind. I can love my family no matter what. And I have joy at my work with my colleagues, right? I have a tremendous brotherhood and sisterhood in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I think I'm going to keep coming back. Thank you so much. That's it for us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot real quick. Stacy. would you like to unmute? Do you want to say anything? I didn't even ask her if she wanted to. So hold on. No, you're good. Okay. Just making sure. Um, I know this is a pretty special moment for Stacy. And uh, this is a special moment for everybody in here. Let's be honest. This that was beautiful. Thank you, too, for coming out and, uh, and parachuting in from Buda, Texas, um, virtually from all over the world. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody, for being here. See, we're now we're at the question and answer part of the meeting. Uh, we're really going to try. I'm going to open up the chat. Let's show some love. Um, publicly and privately, let's let's not let's not let's not blow them up too much with private messages, please. Um, I think they're not, they probably might not even check them. Let's not say anything. Um, but I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, chat is open. Let's uh, show some love, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Marty and Cecil for for uh, for feeding the for for you know feeding the horses and taking care of the peacocks and taking care of each other and doing your best to uh to get each other here today to this moment to share the love you have for alcoholics anonymous and each other it was beautiful thank you so much for explaining your experience strength and hope we're at the shares portion of the meeting the question and answer portion of the meeting so uh if you have a question or anything like that uh for for marty and cecil please raise your hand uh and and i will call on you in the order that you appear uh if you do not know how to raise your hand uh, we're going to try to get to you in the chat if you have a question Marty and Cecil will do their best to answer the question to the best of their ability uh, as their higher power sees fit. Um, if you do not raise your hand, this is going to be awkward because we have half an hour to go. So come on, y'all. Now we, the John L, come on in. Let me, uh, let me get you. Here you go, buddy. Come on. Thank you, man. Come on in. Hey, dog guys. I'm John. I'm definitely an alcoholic. Um, I want to thank you for your service and hospitality, Marty and Cecil. That was kind of my, you know, I sort of had an expectation because I'm an alcoholic. I started, when I came on this meeting and it was talking about relationships, um, I was just one, one-sided with, with this whole meeting, you know, with relationships uh, with my significant other. That's how I was viewing it. And you opened it, you opened it up to such a high, a, a, a broaden my, my horizon, I, I guess I talk about. Um, I mean, you said a lot, a lot of good things, um, but you know the truth. You know, I lack of partnership. I am absolutely guilty of that. You know, my my significant other is on this meeting. We came on this meeting um, uh, because we've had difficulties within within sobriety. You know, and we've both been around for for uh, for, for many years. You know, but um, you know the inability to tell the truth. You know, these just things I wrote down. Um, you, you're, you're wording on stepchildren. You know, I worded, you know, my significant other has three three children. Um, I don't have children. This is an area that I struggle with because I don't know how to be a parent. Um, you know, and I, I always use the word stepchildren. You know, they're our children. You know, we've been together 10 years. You know, um, and I love the, I get to. You know, my sponsor always, always talked to me about that. I get to do these things. I get to pick up the horse poop or the dog poop, you know, I get to do these things, you know, um, you know, but it's the truth, you know, and, and you, you've, oh, you've opened that up for me tonight. I wanted to thank you for that so much. Um, I don't really know if I had a question. I just wanted to uh, thank you for, uh, for you spending the hour with us tonight. It was absolutely dynamite. So thank you very much. 
All right. Thank you. Uh, thanks, John. Um, thanks for all the messages. Um, I will mute my mic in between from now on. Who was up next? Johnny Prince, please come in. Hey, my favorite people. Man, uh, Cecil, I just wanted to ask if, if next time when you're um, when you're attributing all your growth to your wife, if you'd give a little warning so we can send them into a different room, that would be, I'd be real grateful for that. Um, hey, seriously, I, I, I just wanted to kind of, kind of ask y'all how much do you and, and your wife spend together doing any kind of reading or a step work, not step work, but you know what I mean? Uh, kind of like reading or, or discussing uh, the big book or things therein. Well, it's interesting now that we're in a pandemic and we spend every day together and night. Uh, this is an AA house. You know what I mean? Mm. He sponsors lots of guys and he gets to sponsor lots of guys and I get to sponsor lots of gals. And, um, you know, we're not, honestly, we're not the type that sits down and prays together. You know, we pray together before we talk, uh, tonight, we pray together at certain times. We, we have a great little thing we do when we're on vacation, we're, you know, when we're in a hotel room or something like that, or, or we, we have little different incidents of things like that. But, um, we're also, I'm also aware of my tendency to dominate or mother or try to run the show or all that, you know, let him, let him know how he should be praying or what book he might want to consider reading and all that. And I have to stay that hell out of that. That is none of my business. That is none of my business. My husband has a sponsor. He has a bunch of guys he sponsors. He's doing just fine. He does not need my help. He needs what I want him to be is my husband, right? And so I, I, I can tell you this about well, 15 years ago, maybe he goes, I don't need you to sponsor me. And I went, hmm, good point. Good point. So that's why I, that's my view. You know what I, mean? I, I I think it's the same, but I do enjoy it at times. Like when we were gone this summer for a couple of weeks and we enjoyed having that reading time together and that prayer and meditation that followed. And uh, that was just so beautiful. I wish that we could do it more. And uh, perhaps we can when we're not cleaning horse dogs and eating horses and dogs and cats and stuff. It's busy around here real early. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you, John. And Jim. All right. Thanks, John. Next up, we've got Eileen. Please come in. Hi, uh, Eileen Green, Recovered Alcoholic. Thank you guys so much. And thanks for Kevin and everybody putting this this thing on. This is amazing. It's a great, uh, such a great um, uh, topic meeting to have because God knows we all need it. Um, my question for you guys is, um, how did you get here? Like, like um, did you get here through like going to your sponsor and describing, you know, well, I try to control him or, you know, I flip the table or, um, um, uh, you know, or, 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 or marriage counseling, or how did you just get here? Um, you don't have to get so deep if you don't want to, but, um, cause I, I find that, um, I, I need a lot of outside help and not outside AA, but I need a lot of like, uh, uh, advice, not advice, but you know what I mean? I need to bounce stuff off people because I love what you said about, um, coming into the relationship dishonest. I did the same in, in my marriage. And uh, and when I made amends to my ex-husband, um, I was shocked that th that was that was part of it. Um, I never thought I would get there. But how did you guys get here where, where now you, you're, you can work together? Thanks. That's a great question. You want to go first? You know, um, about the therapy, I will say that I am a therapist. I'm a social worker. and uh, and I loved going to therapy. It was really good at informing me, and we know about informing, you know. Now, putting it into application requires step work and, and working on those traditions, uh, following through with those principles. 
And Marty and I meet with two other couples once a month, and we talk about what's going right and what's going wrong. And it is so much fun to get to the part to where we're not mad at each other anymore, but we're actually laughing at each other. Uh, I'm laughing at myself for the things I think and do, and she's doing the same thing. And it's just a great place to be. And that had to do, I think, a lot with the traditions. But if we weren't doing the step work, staying on top of that, um, then I, I couldn't be there. So your turn. So what a great question. Uh, I can tell you, we have been doing this couples meeting for years, I think 10 years at least. And uh, it was the same people. And, and it used to be we would get into these massive fights on the way to the couple's meeting. Yeah. Right. I mean, we'd have to drive an hour across town and we'd, I'd be looking out the window. Right. <laughs> and then we'd get in and we go, well, let me tell you, you know, and uh, and and so we have spent quite a bit of time learning how to take not take ourselves so seriously. I can also tell you that I've probably written 537 inventories on this guy, yeah. right? On this guy right here. I put it in a four column format. I bring it to my sponsor. I run it through six, seven, eight, nine. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing that evening review. I'm doing that on awakening. I'm, 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 you know, neck deep in, sir, in, in, in sponsorship and, and all of that, kind, all of these things. I don't think there's any one thing I can point to. You know, uh, the truth of the matter is, it was not until maybe five years ago, we've been together quite a while, where I could sit at the table without flipping it and talk about money like an adult, like an adult, right? And, uh, Man, that was a lot of work. That was a lot of inventory. You know, the, for me, the 12 steps is how I get any kind of transformation, right? That's, that, that's, you know, and I have, we have done it. We've done couples counseling, family counseling, end of it. We've, you name it, long walks off short piers, you know, we'll, we'll, whatever it takes, you know, um, open to new ideas. But within the confines of AA, for sure, that's my experience. Thank you, Anu. All right, thank you. Next up, what do we got? We got Chris from Reno. Please come in. Hi, uh, everyone. Chris, recovered alcoholic. Uh, hi, Marty Cecil. Good to hear you share your. Uh, uh, I love the interaction between you two. That's just really awesome. And, and, the, and the fact that you, you both are sober and practicing a program, Alcoholics Anonymous, which I saved my life and it, and it does. And it, and, you know, it's funny, I've, I've been in the rooms for 20 years and, uh, uh, I was in a, uh, my, one of the very first ones, they said, uh, would you chair? And I get up there and they're like, okay. And, and they go, pick a topic. And I go, well, I was new. And of course, I was, you know, I had been drinking at her or, you know, and uh, so when I came in, I go, well, um, uh, I just you know, want her back. So let's talk about relationships. And half the room got up grumbling and walked out. Uh, apparently, that's not a popular topic in a AA meeting, uh, but I'm glad you guys are here to help us out. Now, um, you know, single and been this way for a long time in Alcoholics Anonymous, but uh, I've got to that point where I appreciate you guys mentioning um, that uh, 86 where um, where it says, uh, and they trick you, you know, they, they ask you those questions the night before, and then they give you a solution the morning after. Darn them. You know, if I had done that before, then I wouldn't have had to answer those questions the way I do answer them, Right. And I like that um, today I do. I ask him, I loving and kind towards all, you know, and at night when I do, and I do that in, and I practice that here in Alcoholics Anonymous so that I can actually do better out there. My question is, is that how would you suggest uh, a single person in Alcoholics Anonymous um, look towards made, taking that inventory of you know, who they might be uh, in a relationship with. Um, thank you. You mean like 
trying to find a new person or one that you're already in relationship with? I'm not make sure I'm oh, clear. I'm not gonna say trying to find, <laughs> but I'm gonna I'm gonna say uh, you know when 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 you know when the the God uh, you know puts them puts them in your lap sort of thing, right? You know, I don't know. That's probably not a good way to say that. But, you know, uh, they used to say, uh, do the next right indicated thing. And when, you know, she walks by, she's indicating, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, you know, I'm getting embarrassed now, but I'm sure there are plenty of people, other people in this room that are probably think of the same thing. So I'm just the one to say it. Thanks. Uh, how to follow the intuitive thought or action, Chris. There you go. <laughs> yeah, well, that's good. I'm glad I'm going first on this one. Um, no, uh, I still come back to the idea that, you, you know, fitting myself to be of maximum service to God and my fellows, we can kind of say that with a wink and a nod, but, uh, but it's, it's, those principles are true. And, and the, the thing too, is I have to be, I have to stay close to my sponsor. I just do. And so I, I have to be checking out. Am I interested in this person solely because they're interested in me? Am I interested in this person because uh, I don't have anything else to do, so I might as well? Or do I really find this person someone who's interesting, someone I, I truthfully want to get to know better and would like to spend time with? And, and, and I, love, I love alcoholics because they're like, well, we've been dating, we've been on five dates so we're thinking about buying property. You're like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> can we just pop the brakes a little bit? Every day is, we, we look at it as, he the one? Is this the one? Is this the, have I found him? You know what I mean? It's just like, or maybe it's just dinner. I don't know. You know, so that uh, I've always tended to approach life with a sense of urgency, right? This is my shot. I can't blow it. And, and I think, when I'm relying on God, that sense of urgency just can ease with me. That's what I think. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I am happiest when I'm helping somebody else. That's my solution. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, guys. That was a that was a tricky one to wrap to wrap your thoughts around. I'll tell you what, you did a beautiful job. Cammie and George, please come in. Hi, thank you so much. I wish we could be you guys when we grow up. Um, my husband and I are both in recovery and um, I, I just relate to so much you said. Um, he's the calm, cool, collected one and I am the name caller and I love to place blame and um, my question is, though, and before I get on this tangent of the story, is um, I like to, we've had a lot of friends around us die, right, you know, from this disease, and um, I like to get on him about his program, and I stopped doing it for a while, because I, my sponsor advised me that I have to pray about it, and I have to look at my side and do the inventories and all that, and, you know, I started to get resentful, but he hasn't done the steps and I'm going to list all these things. But my question is, how do I stay out of his side with still, you know, he's my husband. We have a family. We have two little boys. He's not doing anything wrong. He's sober six years. I just, you know, feel like he would be more spiritually fit if he did, you know, his steps. And he probably thinks I could be more spiritually fit by shutting up. But, you know, so what, how do I not be because I hate when he tells me anything about my program. So I know coming from me, it's probably the most annoying thing, but I'm coming from a place of love and fear. It's not um, any malice, but I know it's annoying. So that's my question. Thank you. Another great question. You go. Oh. Um, so, you know, they have that saying in, or the suggestion in AA that we can't help our own family members because we're too close, right? And so um, so you say, how do I not do it? Well, you don't do it. And and so for me, for me, who really wants to get in there because I'm nosy as hell, I'm like, so, and this is how I cloak it. You'll appreciate this, Cammie. 
if there's something where I really want to go, well, have you talked to your sponsor about it? Watch what, I, watch the spin. Ready? I say, well, what did Gary say about that? And, and I'm saying a lot of things really with that one state. And it is kind of tongue in cheek. But I'm also telling my husband, I believe in his program. I believe in his sponsorship. And I'm giving him the dignity and respect that I believe he's taking good care of himself. Right? He doesn't need me to mother him. He doesn't need me to criticize him. He doesn't need any of that stuff. Now, I can tell you this. There are, have been times, especially when he was in a tremendous amount of grief, that he, mm. he, he was a little, how shall, I, how shall I delicately say? Lost. He was lost. And um, he was grieving. And he wasn't doing very much uh, from a program standpoint. And the, what I was guided to do, and I did do, was merely do my own thing. And as I continue to work the steps, and as I continue to sponsor and do service and go to meetings and all this stuff, regardless of whether he is, I become that demonstration. Mm -hmm. And if I can become a demonstration, perhaps just maybe, he will find that attractive and say, you know what? Maybe I could have that too. Maybe. But it's all about God in that moment. I cannot be God. And believe me, if I try to play God to him, <laughs> whoo, there's going to be a backlash, as you know, as we all know. And um, that's been my experience. All I can say is that my wife's responses um, at times have been perfect. Like when we were in San Antonio and I said, do we really need to get those lanyards? with the, the green lanyards with the name tags. I did not want them. And she said, I don't know what you're going to do, but I'm getting mine first thing in the morning. And what am I left to do? Go get mine too. So, yeah. Sometimes we do uh, get drug along, but in the right way. So. And I have an old idea that in order to have a happy, successful marriage, we had to be joined at the hip. And we don't. Yeah. And we don't. And it talks about that in the traditions about autonomy, you know, and and self-supporting, both emotionally, physically, uh, 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 spiritually, and these kinds of things. And so when I start to look at that stuff, then instead of being afraid, he's not going to stay sober. I'm going to give him the dignity to take care of his own sobriety. That's a great question. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Can you good with that? Give me a thumbs up. All right, cool. Just making sure. Bo, come on in, my friend. Hey guys, I'm Bobby. I'm an alcoholic. And this is Bo. Wow, Marty and Cecil. I mean, we're two and a half years sober. We got engaged back in October. Um I know I identified and I know she did too, because she was nodding the whole time with it, it made me feel so okay. And so normal, the path that we're on and the things that we go through, especially Cecil wanting to put up the hand and run out the door uh, and the spiritual experiences of meeting um, early in recovery and what that was like when you first met. I know that uh, God has saved me from myself in our relationship with some of the miracles that brought us together. Uh, when I went to propose to her, well, when I went to, to ask her mother for a hand in marriage, I was nervous. Her mom didn't know I was coming. I pulled into a gas station to say a few prayers and her mom pulled in the parking spot beside me. I mean, God's done everything possible to save me from myself. Um, and that's my question was, I heard something in a lead a while back about, am I giving God enough room to work? And, um, you know, when we get to those spots where I want to put up my hand or we're, we're in that, that normal part of the cycle, um, what are some things you guys do to give God enough space to work? And I thought that autonomy was a, a great lead into the question. Thank you. Well, clean stalls, <laughs> feed horses, you know, I mean, just go do something. And, um, 
you know, the, the hardest thing that I've had to learn is that what she does or doesn't do is none of my business. Absolutely none. When I'm starting to get into her business, it's it's going to go wrong. And so I just need to stay out of the way. And to do that, I, I go do something, you know, go put grocery carts up at the at the grocery store. You know, I mean, that's that's my all my guys know that that's one of the things that I preach is go put the grocery carts up. And um, I don't know what it is about that, Bobby, but man, that is great for a relationship. Well, congratulations to you both. Yeah. And may you build a wonderful, loving life together. It's a beautiful thing to grow old with someone as we've gotten to do. We weren't this old when we got together. Um, I, but I had that old idea that when we had a conflict or a difference of opinion or I needed to get my way, basically, that we would sit down and talk about it. We need to have a talk, right? And I thought that we'd have this talk. And then we would have a resolution at the end of this talk, right? And uh, and so one of the many times I had sat him down to have a talk, and and I had done my best talking, and you know I can talk, right? And he uh, looked at me and he said, and I, you've already seen that I take seven thousand words, and he takes about seventy five. Yeah. So I had given my best spiel, and he looked at me and he goes, well what are you trying to do? Argue me into your way of thinking? And I'm like, well, duh. Like, how hard is this, buddy? Get on board. Um, and what I began to understand was there is a, is a relationship is an ongoing conversation. There is no resolution because we'll be different people tomorrow. Each time we pray, we become different people. That goes without saying. So, you know, and so whatever we have resolved to do this week will be different in three weeks or three years or whatever. And so if I'm trying to resolve everything, then I'm going, well, that's not what the rules are, right? Now I'm betrayed. And that's just horse hockey, right? That's horse stall cleaning stuff. But- um, Down by quite you, John. Oh, no. And so, th- so it's about, um, it's about- when I began to see it as an ongoing conversation, it just took all the pressure off and it took away that, you know, let me pound you into my way of thinking. Let's make sure we have a resolution to this conversation and let's just get on with the business of loving each other. So best, best wishes. All right. Thank you. Each time we pray, we become different people. Write that one down. Y'all quote. Odie, I want to. I would love to hear from you. Come on in. Okay. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Odie. I'm an alcoholic, and this is my partner Michelle. And uh, beautiful, beautiful meeting. Thank you so much. I was wondering if you could just um, further discuss briefly. Um, you said that you meet regularly with two other couples, um, so. Do you guys have like a formal meeting format that you follow? And is it based on the traditions or could you just elaborate a bit more? Because I just think that just sounds so beautiful. And it's something that I would maybe like to try and do around here where I live. It's a great thing. Um, did you go first last time? Or did I? No, I went first. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm just, always going just first. Just trying to be respectful. Um, so... So we we've done we because we've been with the same couples for a long time we've done many different things we've studied the traditions many many times um, and we've we've done also some outside literature um, we always have a study thing that we are looking at and so we've done uh, some of we did all of um, the books that were in Dr Bob's library before the big book was published mm-hmm. uh, as a man think it's uh, the greatest thing in the world these kinds of things like that, which was really, really great. Um, one of the, we used to have a couple more members, but one of our uh, core members is an Al-Anon, straight up Al-Anon. And so we've actually done some Al-Anon literature. Uh, and, and that was fascinating, you know, not as Al-Anons, but just to bridge that gap between what 
what is an AA and what is an al -Anon. So that was very interesting. So we always have something we're working out of in this meeting. And then we, um, what we do is we always uh, have it at someone else's house um, and they provide supper. So it's kind of a supper club slash uh, couples group. It's really cool. And I hope you do it and, uh, and choose wisely because uh, with any luck, you'll get to be with these people for decades. All right. Thank you. Um, Patricia, we got, all right, we got time for one more. Um, Patricia, please come in. Oh, hello, everybody. My name is Patricia. I'm an alcoholic. And uh, both both of you have really enlightened me. And um, I, I, the thing that is, you just somewhat answered. I was curious from a standpoint of we're in, in recovery in AA if either one of you do Al-Anon because I hear a little bit of that and also what I recognize the longer that I'm in recovery the better I know how to communicate and I wanted to just ask you about that as well and thank you both from the bottom of my heart you're so kind Patricia oh um I just do AA uh it's my primary it's my only group AA and um I'm not against any other groups. That's just what I belong to. And and it's the same 12 steps. Um, I don't think I need to go someplace else to do it. Now, I do enjoy being involved with other people. Every time we go to a conference, I want to be sure and go hear the Al-Anon speaker. I do not want to miss that because I've had great Al-Anon speakers that I've heard um, speaking, and I think their story is very similar to ours. So. Thank you. You're I have a one of the things I love about um, Alcoholics Anonymous is I have a friend who's in her 90s and she's been in Al-Anon for 50 years and uh, and and straight up Al-Anon and I'm straight up AA and she says you know she's from Texas and she says you know alcoholics want to believe after they've been in AA for a few years that they need to go to Al-Anon for their relationship problems well I'll tell you this I don't need your untreated alcoholism coming into my Al-Anon meeting and wrecking it. What an alcoholic needs to do is study the traditions. And I believe that with all my heart. And I also believe this, and my literature tells me this. See, I'm uniquely qualified. I am uniquely qualified. Anyone who's an alcoholic is uniquely qualified to help a still suffering alcoholic. It tells me over and over, I can reach an alcoholic when no one else can. An alcoholic will tell me the truth before they'll tell it to their doctor, their husband, their wife, their, their lawyer, anybody. They're going to tell it to me. You know why? Because I told them my story. If I'm not in the rooms of AA, how is that suffering alcoholic going to find me? They're not going to be, they're not going to the rooms of al -Anon. They're in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. So I believe like Dr. Bob did, that I have a duty to be in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, right? To help to, my, it says my, our only aim is to be helpful. And that's where I believe I can be the most helpful. So that's what I do. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Don't unmute. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, it, it wouldn't seem right if we wouldn't have mentioned the beautiful rooms of Al-Anon in a relationship workshop, right? Um, please unmute. Please, you guys, unmute. Take us out with some uh, some final thoughts, some final words. I don't even know how you have to say anything else to say. It's so amazing, and a prayer of your choice, please. I just want to say thank you, thank you so much for having us. We've gotten to spend a couple of days with each other, thinking about this, talking about each other, thinking, worrying about how the other one's going to wreck it, yeah. and uh, <laughs> arguing about format, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but what a pleasure and an honor to get to be here with y'all. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if I can help anybody with anything, please. Don't hesitate. Don't hesitate to call. And so I always like to say, let's take a moment and think about those still suffering alcoholics. And I got a good friend of mine who does it like this. She says, think of the people in your building who are still suffering from this disease. Think of the people on your street, in your neighborhood, in your city, in your state. Think about all the people who haven't gotten the opportunity to be with us. Those little children hiding in the closet. Those little, those wives who are afraid he's going to come home. Those husbands who 
don't know what to do. The, the disintegration of families because of alcoholism. And I want to thank God for letting us know I'm just a little bit better. And close with the serenity prayer. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.